Hello, and welcome to our panel today. Um, it's great to have you all here um, at New America for our panel on uh, our, the launch of our report, Suleimani's Shadow. Um, we're going to be looking today at um, the Fatima Yun division, uh, an Iranian proxy, and um, its sort of place in, in Iran's strategy and the way in which Iran looked at uh, using propaganda uh, to cultivate Afghan fighters uh, for its frontline strategy uh, in the region. I'm Candice Rondeau. I am the director of the Future Frontlines Program at New America, which is a public intelligence service that looks at how conflict and polarization and information warfare collide in today's 21st century um, conflicts. And I am also a professor at Arizona State University uh, and a senior fellow at the Center on the Future, Future of War, which is a joint initiative of New America and Arizona State University. Before I introduce our guests today, uh, who are a fabulous panel of some of the, the world's best experts uh, on all things Afghanistan and Iran, um, I want to give you a little bit of background about how this panel came to be and how we kind of um, pulled this report together and, and where it all came from. For the last three years, New America has been working uh, with researchers around the world to document the evolution of 21st century proxy warfare, um, primarily in the Middle East, but also looking, of course, um, at Eurasia and, and the war in Ukraine. Um, we have, over the last three years, published about a dozen reports looking at the way in which the United States, Iran, Russia, and others have used proxy forces, um, foreign forces, to fight their wars uh, on their behalf on the cheap. Um, the report that was just launched today, Suleimani's Shadow, um, was offered by, authored by myself, uh, Amir Tumaj, who's one of our panelists, and Arif Amar, who's another one of our panelists. And it, it really um, covers a, a wide range of things. So we have a great program um, for you today um, that I think um, will show, um, I think, how today, uh, the evolution of proxy warfare uh, involves not just guns and guys, but increasingly involves uh, a look at narratives. And, um, and social media in particular uh, increasingly plays a role in how these narratives are shaped. So let me first um, kick off by introducing our panelists. Um, first, let me start uh, with my colleague, Amir Tumaj. Um, Amir uh, has been working with us at New America on this report for quite some time now. He um, has a background in, in um, looking at Iran and, and its political um, and economic uh, factors and, and how that shapes Iran's strategy and geopolitics. Um, he is the co-founder of the Axis Resistance Monitor, uh, and he is um, one of the top scholars out there uh, on the Fatimi Yun. Uh, Arif Amar, my longtime um, comrade in arms from Kabul, um, from our days at International Crisis Group, uh, joins us today from Washington. Uh, he is an independent researcher uh, who recently worked with the Armed Conflict Location Event Database um, covering Afghanistan, and he continues to cover Afghanistan uh, from here in Washington. And then our two respondents today, uh, uh, the very brave gentlemen who um, took it upon themselves to read our report, uh, and spend some time talking with us uh, and who in many ways inspired uh, our work. Um, we have with us today uh, uh, Ali Alfana, um, who uh, in addition to uh, being um, one of another scholar who's worked very hard uh, on the Fatimi Yun, is a senior fellow at the Arab Gulf States Institute. And he's the author of the Polit Political Succession uh, in the Islamic Republic uh, of I Iran. Um, and then also, last but not least, um, joining us from Kabul is Ahmed Shuda Jamal, uh, another longtime comrade in arms, um, and also a great scholar on all things Fatimi Yun. Um, today, um, he is joining us from Kabul, where he um, works with the National Security Council uh, of Afghanistan, um, and of course, uh, is a key player uh, in the future of Afghanistan today. Um, so let's start uh, maybe 
if we can, our conversation with kind of a 30,000 foot view. Uh, we're gonna kind of run through kind of some of the things that we know and don't know about the Fatimiyun and where they fit in Iran in our conversation. And then we'll have some time for a Q and A toward the end of our, our discussion today. Um, so just kind of as a scene setter, one thing we know, of course, right now is that the war in Afghanistan and the U.S. involvement in Afghanistan is beginning to wind down. And, and you know, different players, uh, stakeholders in the region, Iran, Russia, China, are all starting to kind of try and position themselves um, for what will be a post-NATO uh, Afghanistan. Um, the question we probably have, though, is sort of how did we how did we arrive at this point uh, where Iran finds itself uh, in a place where it can position itself? Uh, and I think I want to turn to Ali first um, and see if he can kind of give us a, a kind of snapshot of a where we are today um, in terms of Iran's involvement uh, in Afghanistan in the region writ, writ large, but also talk a little bit about why Iran, um, you know, has decided on a proxy warfare strategy in the first place. So a very uh, good afternoon to you all, and thank you very much for kind invitation and for providing me this opportunity to share my analysis with you. Uh, I think the war in Afghanistan shows us uh, that proxy warfare is demonstrably effective. In other words, it is a very desirable way of war. 20 years ago, the United States invaded Afghanistan, managed to dismantle the Taliban regime, and has been trying to rebuild Afghanistan for the past two decades. And exactly during those two decades, uh, a neighboring country, uh, Pakistan, has waged a proxy warfare against the United States of America and against the NATO alliance, and appears to have won that proxy war. It is a war which has crippled the United States military and uh, in, makes the Afghan government incapable of controlling its territory. Pakistan has done it on the cheap. If it had gotten involved in Afghanistan directly by deploying a national army, it would have been directly in war with the United States. It has done so indirectly. And it has not paid that much money to the Taliban proxies that very soon, unfortunately, may even seize control over the capital, Kabul. And let's also not forget that Pakistan has more or less never been held responsible for its proxy warfare against the United States. In this light, it's perfectly understandable that any country, not just the Islamic Republic of Iran, but any country is inspired by this method of warfare, which manages to cripple a formidable military organization as that of the United States military and crushes the political will for fighting in Washington. So, I mean, you, I, I wanna push back a little bit, um, but also kind of open the floor to talk to Amir a little bit as well. But uh, you mentioned, uh, Ali, just to press the point a little bit that, that Pakistan um, hasn't paid very much. In fact, it seems like um, Pakistan has benefited from the largesse of the United States simultaneously. Um, what do we make of that? Why, why was it so difficult for the United States um, to understand and manage the role of Pakistan in the context of the region? The United States largesse towards uh, Pakistan is the reason why other countries, particularly the Islamic Republic of Iran, find it also desirable to have a nuclear weapon capability because the United States knows very well that yes, Pakistan as it is, is a nuisance, but what if this regime collapses? Who will get hold of the nuclear weapons? Therefore, Pakistan and the government of Pakistan, the ISI, they can behave extremely badly and at the same time be rewarded for that bad behavior because collapse of the regime in Pakistan and chaos would be even worse from the point of view of the United States than the destructive and destructive behavior of Pakistan in Afghanistan. In this slide, the, the, the conclusion for the Islamic Republic is very clear. Yes, the preferred method of waging wars against a larger and bigger power is proxy warfare. 
and two, it would be even more better if the Islamic Republic possessed a nuclear weapon capability. That's quite a, an assessment. Amir, given all the motivations and, and everything that Ali has just sort of unpacked for us in terms of kind of the regional view and this kind of 30,000 foot view on uh, proxy warfare, just maybe try and set the scene a little bit for folks who don't know much about uh, the Fatimiyun and Iran's relationship with Afghanistan, uh, and in particular, the, the Hazara community uh, of Shia Muslims that makes up such a substantial portion of Afghanistan's population. Thank you very much for this opportunity and for this panel. Uh, to sort of begin, we'll take back to the 1979 revolution in Iran and the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. After that, uh, the IGC started to sponsor some Afghan fighters to fight the Soviets, but then soon found itself involved in the Iran-Iraq war after Iraq invaded in 1980. And that really diverted significant resources from supporting the war effort in Afghanistan. But as one IGC commander, he retells it that he, uh, they still started, they still continue to sponsor Afghan fighters to go fight the Soviets. And one commander had this idea that they could, uh, as the way that he put it, increase training of fighters from the ground up and then to deploy them against the Soviets. And that was became the idea of what was called the Abu Zar Brigade, which was the unit of Afghan Shia fighters who went to fight for Iran in the Iran-Iraq war. And this is very remarkable given that the Soviet invasion was still on growing in their own country. But that experience was short-lived uh, because as we've read in the, in the accounts of the IRGC and the, and, the, and the veterans themselves that the IRGC used these Afghan fighters as very disposable. So after a year after they were formed, these Afghan fighters simply refused to fight. But meanwhile, uh, the networks of these Afghan groups, they still remain. Some returned to Afghanistan uh, following the Iran-Iraq war and the withdrawal of the Soviet Union to fight against the Taliban. And then most of them, all of them returned after the US invasion in 2001. Fast forward to 2011, uh, when the Syrian uprising happened, the Islamic Republic perceived that as an existential threat from the onset because the Assad and the Alawite regime have been steady allies of the Islamic Republic from the onset. And Syrian territory provides access to Hezbollah in Lebanon, which is the crown jewel of the Islamic Republic's uh, Arab proxy and a pillar of its power projection abroad. And they figured that if a Sunni uprising succeeded, any Sunni government after that would probably tilt away from Iran. So they viewed that as unacceptable and made a decision by the top echelon, by the IRGC and the Supreme Leader to commit to a strategy to prevent the fall of Assad at any cost. And the plan B at the time was to, should Assad fall, create the condition for an Alawite laid enclave that would be allied for Iran, that would uh, secure Iran's strategic interests in Syria. That's why we see big part of Iran's war effort in the early phases of the conflict were focused on the border with Lebanon. And around 2012, uh, when the Islamic Republic saw the situation in Syria deteriorating rapidly and the Syrian military was hemorrhaging manpower due to defections and due to insurgent gains. And they started to, at the time itself too, they were also embroiled in international sanctions over the nuclear program that was increasingly biting, including with the oil embargo and other secondary sanctions. So they figured to turn to proxy warfare. So as what Ali was saying was to essentially achieve their objectives on the chief while also manage escalation because a full Iranian invasion of the Levant would have been 
unacceptable to the world powers at the time. So they start to bring in Iraqi paramilitary groups who previously had significant experience fighting US-led coalition forces in Iraq. And then Hezbollah started to trickle in with this opening division in 2013. But even in 2012, 2013, they started to see that they needed a lot more manpower. And uh, the answer to them was hiding in plain sight was that they could tap into Afghan Shias. Uh, there's 3 million Afghan Shias living in Iran right now, not all of them living legally. They face discrimination at both state level and both at the social level, but they figured that they could uh, really tap in this, to this resource to fill the manpower shortage that they have. And initially, uh, they tapped into the networks who had previously fought for the IRGC in the Iran Iraq war against the Soviets and against the Taliban. And that's what the first wave, the vast majority of them were veterans of this conflict. And uh, they started to deploy initially at auxiliaries to Iraqi paramilitary groups. And toward late 2013, when most fighters uh, started to come, the, the unit grew and thus was born the Fatim Unit Brigade. And Fatim Unit means people of Fatima. It is named after the daughter of Prophet Muhammad Fatima and the wife to uh, Imam Ali, who was uh, the cousin and also son-in-law of Muhammad. And one of the earliest uh, converts to Islam and Shias believe that the line of succession after the death of the Prophet should have gone to Ali and his and his uh, descendants from the Prophet. And uh, that's important to know for context because the daughter of Fatima and Ali, Sayyid Zainab, her shrine is in Syria near Damascus. And, to, and the call to defend the shrine became a very mortal, a very powerful motivator for Shias to wage holy war in Syria. And Shias today are about 10 to 15% of the global Muslim community, but in the land stretching from Iran to the Levant, more than 50% at the time. So the RGC's bid on the Fatimian proved very effective and they were instrumental in the RGC's war effort in Syria, which uh, successfully prevented the fall of Assad. And it must be noted that the RGC's war effort would not have succeeded without the backing of Russian air power and Russian special forces were extremely effective and they escalated together in 2050. Right, I mean, so we can we can drill down a little bit more on the kind of the Russian Iranian cooperation and collaboration uh, and what that means or what that meant for the, the sort of the beginning of the Fatima Yun's um, you know, kind of revival, uh, if, if, as it were. Um, but I, I want to turn to Arif because you know you, um, you know, you, you've lived and worked in Afghanistan forever. You're born and raised there. Uh, you know, you're part of the community um, that is affected by all of this. Uh, and more importantly, you've been an incredible resource for us uh, on on our report. Um, so, what what was the other side of the equation from your point of view, Arif? I mean. What was the calculus for all the young men um, who suited up to fight uh, for Iran, essentially, uh, and join, you know, and join the the Fatima Yun division? And, and I mean, do you remember uh, roughly kind of when you started hearing about that, and, and how you first received news about the Fatima Yun division? Uh, thank you, Candice. Uh, it has been a pleasure working with you and uh, Amir on this report. Uh, uh, let me start with the, when did I hear about it or how did we hear in Kabul? Uh, number one, that uh, the news about the division came very late to Afghanistan because the bulk of the recruitment took place in Iran, as Amir uh, pointed out. Uh, and uh, in Kabul, when we learned about it, so we thought that it has been a very secret uh, operation and a secret uh, type of process to recruit people. Uh, so there was little information until between 2015 and 2016, uh, there was not much about in the social media or in the mainstream media about the division's uh, role, what they are doing in Syria. 
when uh, the news about uh, uh, some of the major shocking news, like uh, the detention of some prisoners of the Fatimian division came out that Daesh released to the social media. Uh, this was a sort of uh, alarm and this was a kind of breaking news for many uh, viewers and audiences in Afghanistan that there are Shia fighters uh, in Syria. And then uh, gradually the social media played a very important role uh, in terms of sharing information about more information about the Fatimian. Uh, but again, I should uh, emphasize that the mainstream media in Afghanistan did not cover a lot about it. There was not a lot of substance information about Fatimian division in Afghanistan. And uh, this was uh, very interesting uh, because in, in maybe there are different reasons behind that, but the main reason could be that uh, there was not a lot of perception among the community and also within the Afghan society because of the sensitivity of the issue and because of the sectarian part of that, uh, there could be many other reasons behind that. So in terms of the motives and uh, how the young fighters uh, volunteered or they were recruited, so there are two uh, different uh, perceptions or there are two different schools of thought about this. Uh, the most dominant one is that uh, most of the young Afghans who have lived in Iran for, who have been grown up, I, I should, I should uh, call them the third generation of the, uh, these refugees who have lived in Iran, their parents have lived, have migrated to Iran during the 1970s and 80s. Uh, so the bulk of the recruitment took place from within these young, uh, people, uh, young men who have, most of them uh, have been born in Iran or they have grown up in Iran. So this was the main factor uh, that people didn't know a lot about that in Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, the second thing, uh, the second important thing about this aspect is that most of these young men were jobless or they had, uh, they were facing financial constraints in Iran. At the same time, they were facing social pressures and frustrations because of discriminations and problems of residency and things like that. So a large number of these young people were facing a crisis of community identity and they were facing a financial crisis. So they joined the division because they were given promises of good salaries. Uh, they were given the promises of issuing for the issuance of permanent residency in Iran. At the same time, so these young people were in the pursuit of acquiring uh, or receiving uh, a sort of uh, social prestige within their families and communities in Iran. So these are some of the factors that they joined uh, and uh, it was appealing for them to join the ranks. But I will also categorize in the second hand, the ideological and religious factor behind this, uh, that a number of uh, Fatimian fighters who have joined the ranks, who have joined voluntarily, uh, they are inspired and influenced by the ideological and religious uh, factor and sympathy that is as a that has been resulted by the IRGC's uh, very strong strategic communication and propagation to defend the harem of uh, Zainab in Syria and to embrace martyrdom and then come back home or you have been, you will be granted with a lot of things. You will earn money, you will earn prestige and you will also earn martyrdom. So it was a win-win situation and game for most of these young fighters uh, who uh, volunteered uh, to go to Syria. So. As a whole, I, uh, it's important to uh, emphasize again that uh, a lot of things happened and developed within Iran. And then the news later on came out to Afghanistan into the community between 2015 and 2016. And in 2016, there were a couple of uh, articles which were print issued by the New York Times and Wall Street Journal. And that was also a sort of information sharing more about what is happening between um, within the Fatimian and who are they and why they are fighting in Iran. So in general, uh, the division, uh, uh, I should say that the, the division uh, has been comprised of both religious and non-religious uh, composition. 
uh, but mostly the motive has been non-religious rather than religious. Uh, and uh, I can continue on this if uh, there are further questions on that. Thanks, Arif. That's really, I mean, so, I mean, you're kind of touching on a lot of different things that I think, um, you know, are very much central to our report uh, in terms of kind of the, uh, the backgrounds, right, of a lot of these young men who went to fight, but also kind of some of the grievances and uh, grievance narratives, right? Um, and, and Shuja, you spent a, a lot of time, uh, you know, before you joined the government, interviewing um, current and former members of the Fatima Yun division, some who had returned back to not just Iran, but to Afghanistan. What's your take? I mean, what, what did you hear from them about their experience, um, not just their motivations, but their actual, their experience on the front line? Well, Thank you very much, Candace, for having me, and congratulations on this excellent, excellent report. Um, I followed the work of the people on this panel for a number of years, and I have tremendous respect for the expertise and the thoroughness and the quality of the work that they produce. Um, and um, I am privileged very much to be on this uh, on this panel. As you said, I've actually followed the work of the Fatimiyun for a few years. Uh, my first contribution was some research that I did for Human Rights Watch back in 2014 after which uh, um, I kept working on this issue as an independent researcher, produced a report for the US Institute of Peace. Um, and now that I'm in the government, I am uh, tracking the issue as well, including with the Iranian government. Um, there, we've, been, we've had some conversations on this issue. But today, uh, in order to be able to speak freely, to be able to speak uh, much more usefully to your, to your audience here, I'm going to be speaking not as a public official, but as an individual researcher who has worked on this issue for a few years. Uh, so uh, to add on top of the excellent uh, uh, comments and contributions made by Arif and Amir, uh, let me add uh, that uh, there, were, there, was, there was some voluntary recruitment, uh, but there was also a vast, vast scale of either direct coercion or circumstances that actually amounted to coerce, coercion, course of recruitment. Um, in 2014, 13, when ISIS was on the rise, they were threatening the outskirts of Damascus itself. Uh, the US troops were, so, so four or five things are coinciding together. One of them was that in Afghanistan, the US troops started um, uh, withdrawing, which, which means that they stopped their counterterrorism, uh, sorry, they stopped the counterinsurgency mission. Um, and, it, uh, and so the, uh, at around this time, also, the international aid to Afghanistan started uh, dropping precipitously. And so a lot of people started panicking. The wave of refugees that, that, that washed up on the shores of Europe also uh, prompted a lot of Afghans to go to regional countries, including Iran. At the same time, though, Iranian response was that they escalated significantly the forced deportations of Afghans across the border. And this was not just a forced deportation escalated to unprecedented proportions. This was deportation that the deportees were forced to pay for. And so that was, that was trend number two. Trend number three was the Syria escalated around 2014, 2015. Trend number four, uh, sorry, trend number five was that um, uh, people leaving Afghanistan in a panic in search of employment opportunities in Iran only to encounter uh, increased threats of deportation that you are forced to pay for, were given the choice. You either go and fight in Syria or you go home. If you go and fight in Syria, you become martyred. It's, you know, it's an everlasting glory for you. But if you don't and you survive, then you know, here are some of the incentive packages that you and your family could be qualified for. The problem with the incentive package was that it was a game of sort of um, telephone. I heard that somebody said that this is what the Iranian government is paying you. And so there was a lot of information, but among it, there was also a lot of misinformation. So people were misled either by design or by, by, uh, uh, by default about the benefits that awaited them at the other end. And so um, with these sort of complex set of motivations, you're putting together a number of divisions to, uh, to amount into an army at the peak of it, um, uh, which, uh, you know, ideally would not be a, an excellent fighting force, primarily because the motivations are so diverse. And so if you compare the Fatih Moon fighters with the people flocking to the ISIS ranks in Syria around the same time, 
this, the, the, the ISIS fighters were radicalized, radical extremists who flocked into Syria. The Fatimiyun were non-radicals who went into Syria and fought, and some of them may have returned as radicals after the fighting experience in Syria. Because in Syria, there was indoctrination, you know, they had religious people working at them on Fridays and Thursdays and, and Ashuras and Muharrams and, and Ramadans. Um, and so uh, what you have is two different sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, directions of causality. Radicalism uh, drove ISIS fighters to Syria. A mix of uh, issues drove Fatimid fighters into Syria, and some of them returned radicals. Uh, so uh, all of this is to say that um, a number of international global trends intersected. I think I described four or five um, that, that propelled this unprecedented number of Afghans fighting a proxy war abroad. So, I mean, that's, you are raising, I mean, all of those trend lines converging as they did um, kind of at the outset of the Arab Spring, um, plus, you know, <laughs> interestingly, regime change in Washington that kind of coincided, right? I mean, Obama, you know, is leaving office in 2012, uh, or at least he's changing, he's changing his uh, administration in 2012. Um, and so we have new players and uh, as usual, <laughs> as always happens, uh, you know, every four years in Washington, um, there's a, a sort of reassessment of how to deal with Syria, how to deal with Iran, how to deal with Afghanistan, but they're all perennially chain linked together. Um, and, you know, we think about that often in terms of, you know, states as if they're sort of monoliths doing stuff, um, you know, chess pieces on the board. But what you and Ali and Amir and Arif are describing is actually, you know, um, a pretty messy uh, set of circumstances where um, you have mixed motivations. And I think to Ali's point uh, earlier on, you know, when we talk about proxy forces, particularly in this context, in the, in the cauldron that is, you know, South Asia and the Middle East, um, we have to talk about them in a comparative way. Uh, I think I think your um, observation, you know, that ISIS, you know, consisted of fighters who wanted to be there. Uh, they sacrificed an enormous amount. They left their families behind. Sometimes they took their families with them and lost them. Um, you know, there was a completely different set of motivations going on there uh, and a, an extremely effective propaganda campaign on behalf of the ISIS kind of core. Um, and, and interestingly, what I think, you know, you know, it, at the center of our work in this paper, um, you know, we, we wanted to make sure that we weren't replicating uh, stuff that had been done before. I mean, you know, you've talked with all the fighters before, uh, Shuja and Ali, of course, has covered kind of the, um, the kind of 30,000 foot view and put all that into context. But for us, um, I think for Amir, Amir and I and, and Arif, we were really um, compelled by the fact that um, the IRGC, the Iran uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, which is of course uh, the premier force and strategy uh, leading Iran's strategy in the region, um, expended so much energy and money uh, and, and sort of political capital on building up YouTube channels and you know Twitter accounts and Facebook posts and uh, Sarush, right, which is the kind of uh, Iranian version of Twitter, basically, uh, or Telegram, kind of closer to Telegram, you know, and. And there were all these other pieces, these other elements uh, that came to play. And I think Amir, um, you, you hit on this in your look at how the pilgrimage, uh, you know, pilgrimages from, uh, you know, either Afghanistan or Iran uh, into Iraq, uh, where you have all these sort of sacred, uh, and Syria and all these sacred uh, shrines. Um, is a is a key and pivotal part of the cultivation and kind of the cultural production that the IRGC uh, finds so useful. So talk a little bit about that um, and kind of this sort of combo pack, if you will, of how Iran leveraged social media, um, you know, in, in this sort of 21st century environment, and then these kind of old school uh, methods of just, you know, pamphleting people and recruiting them, uh, you know, at the shrines on the pilgrimage trail. Uh, is Absolutely. Directed to uh, me or okay. Either one, if you would like to go no, first. No, 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 no. I'm happy please, to defer. Please, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, that is a very good question. And I'll briefly talk about the Islamic Republic's precarious relationship with social media. Initially, after, uh, especially after the 2009 protests in Iran, in which protesters mobilized 
uh, against the Islamic Republic by coordinating through Twitter and Facebook, it, the state took a very hard approach and we still see remnants of that where Twitter, Facebook, virtually every single app, social media outlet, except Instagram perhaps, uh, is censored in Iran. Uh, but in the 2010s, uh, they start to, we start to see a change in this approach that they see advantages and benefits uh, to social media through which to project influence, power, shape their own narrative. And I think the best point case that illustrates that is the rise of Ghassan Soleimani, the former commander of the Quds Force, of the Quds Force, who was uh, killed in 2020 by a US drone strike, he became famous through selfies on social media. And this was after the rise of ISIS in uh, 2014, where there were questions in Tehran about Soleimani's management of the war, how he could not foresee ISIS's incursion. So then he started to post uh, photos with fighters on the front line and he became an internet sensation. There were memes about him and he became a superstar. And Soleimani transformed to both the medium and the message about the Islamic Republic's power projection in the Middle East. And that really illustrated the point that they could really take advantage of these opportunities on social media. So one, Candice, to your point about uh, pilgrimage sites was how uh, there is a Shia pilgrimage called Adbain, which is which commemorates the 40th day after the death of the third Shia Imam Hussein at Karbala in the seventh uh, century, and he was killed by the forces of the Umayyad uh, Caliphate. And uh, Hussein is the is the son of. Uh, Fatima and Ali, uh, and that is a very pivotal moment in Shiism that sealed the Shia Sunni split. And Arbain is uh, tens of millions of people have gone there. It's one of the largest pilgrimages in the world. And there's a tradition where people often go on foot to there, whether if it's from Iran or farther distances, or they go to some cities in Iraq, like Ajaf and such, and go to the pilgrimage sites. So what the IRGC started doing is they set up uh, aid stations, whether it's at the border crossing between Iran and Iraq, whether it's aid stations along the way where they would hand out literature, pamphlets. They have uh, aid stations where they put up uh, posters of martyrs. There's even uh, lately where they host documentaries on the Fatih immune and these others to sort of project the message that what the RGC is doing is to defend Shias. And uh, one thing that really helped them was ISIS that uh, was very public about its genocidal intents towards Shias. Uh, and another case in point about how sort of the RGC took advantage of social media was the biggest hits that they had uh, briefly touched on two points were footages in combat, especially in which fighters um, who uh, moments before their death, they take a video and they extol values of martyrdom, self-sacrifice, and those uh, become really popular social media. And there's another one about re religious singers, how uh, they go lead congregation and ritual chest beatings and uh, they sort of copy modern music and uh, implement elements of pop and such to make catchy religious songs. And these have proven extremely effective to motivate fighters. We saw it in the Iran-Iraq war. And a lot of these guys went to Syria to rile up fighters before combat and then post the videos online that were passed around. And uh, these are some of the examples that uh, the IGC used. I also briefly touched on another one was uh, IGC linked and state media outlets have set up these professional studios where 
they were when a fighter is killed. Uh, some fighters, they uh, essentially have the family meet the casket of the fighter. As you can imagine, this is, this is a very emotional, raw event, and they capture it all with the family embracing, uh, essentially embracing the fighter. They show everything about it, and then they go post that online on Instagram and reading through the comment sections, uh, those were the ones that really riled up a lot of emotion. People who were writing on it wrote often sectarian messages, oftentimes against uh, Sunnis, against Erdogan and everything. So these were some of the examples which the RAGC's propaganda machine, including state media outlets in which the Islamic Republic has invested billions of dollars over the years, took advantage of new technology and social media to get their messages across and socialize a new generation of Iranians. And while it was a smaller generation than the Iran-Iraq war, this was very energetic for the Islamist base and to rile up fighters. So, I mean, a, a, a mix of the old and the new, right? I mean, I think that's one of the things that is so remarkable about um, Iran's very, I, mean, I think a learning journey in a way, in terms of um, drawing on its experience from the 1980s and then pivoting um, you know, to use social media in ways that perhaps it would not have thought to do uh, some time ago, but then combining that with these kind of old school methods. But the thread, the central thread is um, the, you know, the Sunni Shia schism, uh, the, the kind of narratives around marginalization um, and, and kind of playing on those grievances uh, you know, amongst a population that in, in Afghanistan and also the bordering regions of Afghanistan with Iran, right? Um, you know, a, a lot of Hazaras find themselves in these very precarious circumstances, uh, which, you know, uh, Shuja was just describing. And, you know, one of the things I think, Arif, that you actually explored, um, I think in great detail was also kind of the influence of these old line networks from some of the imams uh, Afghan imams who back in the 1950s, 60s, uh, you know, began kind of cultivating ties across the border um, in, of course, the sacred city of Gom uh, and also in Najaf. Talk a little bit about that and kind of how that played out and how it continues to play out today. Uh, in the context of uh, the Shia world connection, uh, how the Shia scholars have connected with each other during the course of the modern history. So of course, there have been a, a few number of uh, Shia scholars uh, from, the Sh from the Afghan Shia community, both uh, Hazara Shia and non-Hazara Shia, as I should say, because Shia is not only the Hazaras in Afghanistan. There are, there's a great uh, uh, other communities that they are also Shias. So back in the 19, uh, 40s and 50s, uh, this exchange of uh, scholars started uh, and Afghans started uh, moving out of uh, Afghanistan, traveling to Mashhad uh, and then from Mashhad to Qum. And then uh, some of them traveled to Iraq and to Syria because in terms of the Shias, uh, she has a very popular uh, universities, uh, religious universities. There are two of them very popular. One is based in Najaf, uh, which is a religious city, and also the shrine of Imam Ali, the Shia's first Imam, is based there. So Najaf has always uh, has been uh, since long time has been a very important uh, place uh, for the scholars. Uh, so many scholars and religious authorities have graduated from Najaf. And then from Najaf, when the Islamic revolution uh, was successful, so they tried somehow to transfer the authority of the Shia leadership and authorities from Najaf to Qum. And the Iranian invested a lot to make, to turn Qum as the main headquarters of the Shia world uh, scholars. So back in the 1950s and 60s, a number of the uh, Shia, Afghan Shias traveled like Ismail Balkhi, uh, and uh, he was the first pioneer of the Afghan Shias who migrated, who traveled actually to Iran, and then he started studying in Mashhad, and then he traveled down further to Iraq and Syria. So he was a type of 
Sayyid Jamaluddin, another uh, popular figure in the Islamic world. He wanted to travel around and find out uh, more and to make connections with the rest of Islamic scholars around the world. So he was the first man who pioneered this. And then when he returned back to Afghanistan, so he faced problems within the government and he was, he did not find a kind of easy space uh, within his own community. Uh, he was under pressure by the government. So he traveled back to Iran and then he established this contact. And he was uh, an inspiration for several other important uh, Shia leaders who traveled between Iran and Afghanistan. And so there has been a connection uh, uh, and uh, this connection was strengthened during the jihad in the 1980s. Uh, the jihad against the Soviet, the war against Soviet's uh, invasion in Afghanistan. And then IRGC, which is very popular in terms of how to manage all these small networks of religious groups and other groups. So they try, they somehow controlled and they maintain contact and connection with these religious figures uh, because these religious figures were given the funds to establish madrasas and also to disseminate funds to the rest of cultural religious activities, uh, both uh, in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, so the connection has always been there. And uh, this connection was a kind of, a, a kind of sheer religious uh, type of inspiration for the rest of the community. And the IRGC has utilized uh, these Shia religious uh, figures in a very effective manner uh, from time to time. Uh, so as we have observed in this report that some of these religious figures have issued uh, religious decrees and fitwas from Baghdad, from Qum, and they have encouraged uh, the young fighters to go to Syria and defend the Haram of Zainab. So the religious aspect of the uh, issue is very much uh, prominent here, of course. However, uh, I should mention that it has been done in a very low profile manner because of the sensitivity of the issue back in the Afghan society because Hazaras are, have proved to be a, a responsible uh, community in Afghanistan, especially in the post-Taliban era and they have participated very openly and widely in the democratic process in the country. So the religious sect or I should layers of the society have been very cautious and conservative uh, and uh, we have no evidence in the side of Afghanistan that a religious uh, leader or a Shia religious authority has encouraged or issued something, a statement in favor of Fatim Yun. And that's something very important to notice uh, uh, here. And uh, we also have somehow uh, pointed out that in the report. Yeah, I mean, so I, I see um, uh, Shuja nodding, and I'm going to turn to him in a second, the other Kabuli here, um, and I'll, I'm the fake Kabuli, uh, but I just want to sort of offer, I think, an additional... Exception. <laughs> Thank you for accepting me. Um, uh, you know, one of the things I uh, want to sort of say here, you know, many people have asked me over the years, you know, I've been going in and out of Afghanistan, it's been a long time since I've been there, but I've been working on Afghanistan and trying to understand it for a very long time, and um, a, a frequent question I get from a lot of Americans is, you know, um, you know, what what's going on there, what's it like, and I think one of the things that for me, um, is really important for, I, I think, not only our American audience and others to understand is, um, you know, Afghanistan is a majority minority country. Um, and when we when we talk about its population makeup, and we talk about the Taliban and all these different factions, it's really important to remember that it's extremely diverse. Um, and it's not just diverse in terms of ethnicity. I mean, there's a deep diversity of thought uh, and experience. Uh, importantly, I think, uh, you know, in the Hazara community, something that I have noted uh, in my years of uh, working alongside a lot of Hazaras, uh, you know, there is, again, a very variegated idea about the role of religion in life. Uh, some Hazaras are just really straight, straight up secular, just as many Pashtuns are, just as many Tajiks are. Um, so it's important, as you know, we're talking here not to sort of paint with a broad brush the entire Hazara community. Um, what we're talking about here is a very narrow slice. And Shuja, I'm sure you have something to say on that. Yes, absolutely. And look, in the course of the, the report that I did for the USIP, um, I spoke not only with dozens of these current and former fighters, but also dozens uh, of uh, Afghan, Hazara, and Shia um, political, community, and religious leaders. 
And what you see in that process is that all of them, uh, you almost without reservation, support the fight against ISIS for reasons that we all understand. You know, ISIS is a tech theory organization, a tech theory ideology, and all of that. Uh, but in fact, almost all of them are actually opposed to the use of Afghan citizens in the fight against ISIS in somebody else's land. In fact, many of them are outright afraid of what that would mean for the community in Afghanistan, because ISIS is not just a phenomenon in Syria or parts of Iraq, but it's become unfortunately a bit of a global phenomenon with presence in Afghanistan as well. And so to the extent that there's a, a difference in the operating environment in which Afghan Shias are picked for fighting abroad by Iran, uh, I uh, remember Amir talked about the uh, the Abu Zar group uh, in, in the, during the so-called sacred defense Iran-Iraq war. Uh, there's a tremendous difference. And the difference is that back then in, in the, during the sacred defense, um, there wasn't enough um, awareness, there wasn't enough community mobilization around the issue. But today, not only is there significantly greater awareness, but there's also significantly greater opposition to Iran's use of Shia fighters in conflicts abroad. And so um, the pan-Shia ideology in Afghanistan has few, if any, takers. I'm not saying there are no takers. The pan-Shia ideology in Afghanistan has few, if any, takers which is important because uh, it has long-term implications, not just for Iran, but also for Afghanistan and for the region. So when we talk about the Shias in Afghanistan, I think it's important for us to speak with nuance and finesse, the way we speak about communities elsewhere in other countries. Um, and so this is also significant, uh, especially the implications in Afghanistan, because Iran has actually shown to be a very um, highly rational and motivated by its self-interest because it's maintained excellent relationship with Al-Qaeda. Uh, that's been very well documented in the public domain. It's also maintained good relations with uh, Taliban over the years, even though there was that very bitter uh, and acrimonious uh, sort of uh, emotionally scarring experience where the Taliban killed a number of Iranian diplomats in the 1990s in Mazar Sharif. And so, if Iran were to use a proxy unit in Afghanistan, it's a thought experiment. Um, I think that the much more, uh, it, this is by no means to say that this is happening or this is being uh, planned, it's just as a thought experiment. If Iran were to use um, a, 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 an organized militia group in Afghanistan, um, they would have a, a much better chance uh, of being effective with the minimal investment if they used, say, the Taliban um, to, to protect its interests, as opposed to the Fatimiyun, which is a much more scattered, diverse. Uh, a lot of them are skeptical, cynical. Um, the returnees uh, doing uh, like the, like the Roman legionnaires. You know, you go fight and you come back to your to your uh, to your um, farm outside of Rome. A lot of these Afghan former fighters in the Fatimiyun have come back and they've settled in these areas, either in cities but also in some of their older farm communities to return to their fathers and to their families. Um, like I said, a lot of these people were lured with the promises of a number of things. Some of those promises were genuinely made by the organizers, the IRGC. Others were not. Um, and so when you go there and you come back expecting the promises that were made or not made, but you thought that were made, uh, but you were not entitled to anything in reality, then you become uh, cynical and jaded. Um, and so to organize a cynical and jaded group of Afghans in, in Afghanistan, because remember, some of the more motivated Fatimiyun actually who received Iranian benefits have not really returned in Afghanistan. They're still in Iran. Um, so to organize uh, sort of a disgruntled, jaded group of scattered Afghans in, in Afghanistan to, into, into a cohesive fighting unit, you have a much more uphill battle uh, as opposed to using, say, the Taliban outright. Um, so that's just a, uh, an observation, a thought experiment. Um, the, the point is that it's important to speak about the Shia religious community in Afghanistan with finesse. Um, and that the pan-Shia ideology that a lot of the people ascribe to this community is actually uh, not as strong as many people believe, especially many, many uh, folks uh, um, who've studied this um, outside of Afghanistan. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, a great point. I mean, I'll, you know, this might seem like a bit of a, a raw comparison, but, you know, the Black community in the United States, you know, which is, of course, a minority, is by no means monolithic, right? And, it, you know, you have religious um, African-Americans, you have non-religious ones, you have uh, liberals, you have conservatives, 
Um, and, you know, there has been no successful um, pan African American movement except for the role of trying to push for civil rights, right? And I think actually, interestingly, there is a parallel in Afghanistan uh, in terms of the Hazaras um, sort of role in pushing for a more equal um, and um, accessible governance structure in, in Afghanistan. So let me um, turn to Ali because, you know, he, he has kind of like this 30,000 foot view. He's our resident theorist. What do you think, Ali, I mean, given everything that we've said here are some of the big lessons learned strategically for Iran, um, not only just on the Fatah Mayun, um, but maybe talk a little bit about kind of um, the use of propaganda uh, and kind of narratives to build uh, mobilization. What do you think Iran's takeaways are? Uh, well, uh, then I take the liberty of starting with uh, the strategic lessons that the Islamic Republic has learned. Uh, the Islamic Republic in the 1980s had aligned itself uh, with the Sunni, but Persian speaking Tajik community uh, in the West, mostly known as the Northern Alliance and with such prominent uh, gentlemen uh, on top of the organization, such as Mr. Borhan al Rabbani, Mr. Ahmad Shah Massoud, and others. And the other uh, Iranian allies at the time in the 1980s uh, were the multiple competing and rivaling uh, Hazara groups uh, who, who were uh, Shia and loyal to the Islamic Republic, most of them. Uh, but towards the end of the 1990s, uh, strategists in Tehran discovered that they had made a terrible mistake only by restricting their friends and allies to the Tajik and Hazara communities. Uh, they needed also to have friends among the Taliban uh, who were uh, supported by Pakistan. They were a Pakistani proxy, but the Islamic Republic strategists also sensed that this group also has Pashtun ethno-nationalism but also some degree of Afghan nationalism. Uh, so it is a group that at least in the future they could deal with. So after the uh, terrible incidents of Mazar Sharif and the killing of Iranian diplomats and intelligence officers, uh, the Islamic Republic tried to uh, establish some kind of contacts. And over the years, those contacts have matured to the degree that when one of the leaders of Taliban uh, had been staying in Iran for more than three or four months and was returning to Afghanistan, that individual was killed uh, by a US drone. Which country gave the information about this individual's movements from Iran to Afghanistan? The government of Pakistan, obviously, because Pakistan wants to monopolize ownership over Taliban. So now we have this really interesting game playing out in Afghanistan where, uh, an organization which started as a Pakistani proxy, which is now the preferred partner of the government of the United States, uh, a government which sends Ambassador Khalid Zad to transfer power to the Taliban from the current democratically elected Afghan government, and Iran, which is trying to appeal to the ethno-nationalism uh, of the Pashtuns even. So in this interesting uh, situation, uh, Taliban is desired by all. Uh, and I do believe that the Islamic Republic also has learned the lesson that it was largely unsuccessful with the Fatimian division. Uh, the, I have done statistical studies uh, over uh, those killed in combat in uh, Syria, particularly on the Iranian side. And I see 1,000 Afghans who were members of the Fatimian division and who were killed in combat in Syria. Uh, and the total number of active Fatimian division members who have been around in Syria and also in Iran never exceeded 20,000. Compare this number with the million large Afghan immigrant community in Iran. This community exceeds 2 million individuals. So in other words, the Islamic Republic discovered that it could not, uh, in a meaningful and effective way, mobilize the Afghans. Those Afghans who were mobilized, they were not good fighters. The entire leadership cadre of the Fatimid division was annihilated, killed in the war in Syria. Mr. Tarasim, Mr. Bashki, number two in command of the division, 
So it is quite natural and that in this light, the Islamic Republic prefers to have lines of communication with the Taliban so that there is no vacuum of power. After a Taliban seizure of power in Afghanistan, this is their expectations. This is certainly not what I'm personally hoping for, uh, but those relations uh, secure Iran a, I would say, an accommodation with the new regime, which may come to power in Kabul. So, uh, Shuja, I see you nodding your head, and I want to remind people that Shuja is here um, speaking in his own personal capacity, but I wonder if you could, um, you know, chime in a little bit on some of the lessons learned. I think Ali uh, made a, a number of important points, uh, including the fact that the Fatimiyun hasn't really proven to be any kind of anybody's even remote idea of, a, of an elite, religiously highly motivated uh, fighting unit. I think you're beginning to see in recent years, since at least 2017, that the Iranian government is actually downsizing the Fatimiyun, primarily because um, there is insubordination in the ranks. I spoke to an, a couple of these people who said, um, our Iranian handlers were telling us to go fight there, and we kept telling them it's it's certain death, and, and he kept saying, but you have to go, and we, he was one, and we were many, and we beat him up, and and, and so as a result, uh, I was brought back to Iran and, and it's sort of uh, uh, disciplined. So, so those kinds of things are happening, and when you talk about a scenario like that, you're talking about the the role of motivation and, and, and radicalism in the battlefield. Um, a lot uh, in, in the recruitment of the Fatimiyun, uh, unlike a regular army, there's no physical standards. If you can stand up and walk and hold a gun, you're welcome to be there. Uh, there's no screening for drug use. There's no screening for any kind of physical di uh, you know, difficulty. Uh, there's no screening uh, even for whether your family knows about you. A lot of people have actually faked paperwork and so when you're putting the lowest of the low bars and recruiting a group like that, then you get the result that you get with the Fatim Yun, which is uh, low morale, low motivation, uh, an ineffective group, a fighting group, uh, and a group that has, has had, had a surprisingly large number of its leadership wiped out uh, in the three or four peak active years of its uh, activity in, in Syria. And so Iran has actually been downsizing. They've been taking away the insubordinates. They're taking away the, um, the elderly. They're taking away the uh, people who've had uh, substance abuse issues. Uh, which they try to uh, replicate on the battlefield, or if they didn't receive the substances that they really needed and depended on, they were ineffective. And so they're, they're sort of whittling down to a core, hoping that they would whittle down to a core, radicalized, highly motivated, battle-hardened uh, militia, uh, which may or may not be useful uh, down the road. Um, uh, I'll stop there. Yeah, well, thank you. Listen, um, I mean, it's funny because uh, Arif and, and Amir and I were just talking this morning, uh, we, you know, obviously we've been monitoring kind of developments, you know, in preparation for the launch of the report. Um, but it's kind of interesting that, you know, within the last month or so, you've seen Iran kind of setting, sending kind of messy signals at the same time. Like, I think your, your observations and Ali's observations that there are some big lessons learned here and that Iran understands the limits of the Fatimiyun um, and its ability to kind of influence and then mobilize and then, you know, in the context of the Afghanistan uh, world that we know today, so post, soon to be post NATO. Uh, but let me quickly turn to Arif and, and Amir before we then get to questions and answers with, with the audience. Um, I mean, Arif, tell us a little bit about, so first of all, we saw, uh, I think a couple days ago, was it, there was um, a visit from uh, Ismail Khani, the Quds Force commander out to Syria. What was that about? Uh, there was an unconfirmed news actually, uh, but it was reflected on a number of think tanks uh, based in Syria and a number of uh, Arab world researchers that uh, reported that um, uh, Mr. Qa'ani, the current Quds commander, has visited recently a Fatimian headquarters in Syria around July 9 or around July 8. So that's what we know about that, that much. And then uh, there was another piece of uh, news which was interesting was that the Fatimian division have attacked uh, the US forces uh, in some locations in Syria, and they have exchanged uh, fire with each other. Uh, so we keep receiving such kind of news in the past couple of weeks uh, from Syria. 
At the same time, if you have if, if you have a look at the social media, when whenever you search about Fatimian, there are a lot of uh, people, anonymous or some known people, who are asking what is the role of Fatimian now in Afghanistan as the Taliban are advancing and they are taking territories of Shia community inside Afghanistan. Is there any role for Fatimian inside Afghanistan or not? And this takes us to another question that what is next for Fatimian? So still Iran is trying to play the strategic communication of the IRGC is active uh, and uh, they maintain uh, a lot of presence in the social media and they try to uh, somehow uh, portray the situation in a manner that Fatimian is still there and they are capable of attacking uh, US. And uh, and also I, I can share you another piece of unconfirmed report, which is very much interesting is that uh, an, a number of uh, very uh, uh, highly trained Fatimian uh, uh, fighters uh, who are non-Hazara Shias, uh, they have been deployed and dispatched to the Israeli borders uh, between Syria and Israel. And they are tasked with intelligence uh, activities because the Iranian IRGC believe that Israelis have hired Arab intelligence uh, agents across the border. So the best way to confront those Arab intelligence officers is to utilize Fatimian uh, intelligence officers who do not look and feature like the Hazaras, but they are non Hazara Shia Fatimian. So these are some of the interesting stories that we hear from our, uh, from some of them or some of them are from our, uh, from contacts that we rely on them. And that's uh, something interesting uh, development happening. Yeah, there. so super interesting in the sense that like, here we have a situation where, I mean, I think, you know, Ali and Shuja have made a great assessment essentially of kind of the, the practical and pragmatic lessons learned uh, and how Iran is gonna apply them going forward. But still, some signaling going on. That it's a little unclear, um, you know, where those signals are coming from. We haven't really talked much about Israel, and maybe we'll get into that. Um, uh, Amir, uh, maybe you want to touch on Israel, and I know that uh, Shuja. I'm, I saw kind of a, a glancing two finger there, uh, and I'll give it to you. So, Amir, quickly, why don't you tell us a, a little bit about your impressions? Uh, on the on the Israel point that. Uh, the IGC, like its other proxies, has uh, tried to socialize in its indoctrination of fighters this, uh, to cultivate this commitment that the Fatimun would fight and annihilate Israel, which is a very far-fetched dream, but that sort of uh, goes to show how much of uh, emphasis they put it in propaganda. And there's a video of uh, that made rounds earlier, which uh, the Fatimi co-founder, one of them where he was in Syrian Golan Heights, was overlooking Israel and say, we'll take it over the summer. He was killed not that long after that. Um, and they will so sort of touch on what everybody has been saying, which I agree uh, that in terms of they want to keep a committed core of fighters to Syria. And then there's also another uh, aspect of it that there's a couple of uh, even potentially up to several hundred reportedly former Fatih new fighters who went to fight in Libya on the behalf of Haftar. And then there was even one report from a local uh, news agency that uh, some Fatih new fighters stationed in Syria directly deployed to Libya from there. So essentially in subordination uh, from the IBC and they probably uh, went for money. It's not hard to imagine with that. And there is a broader sense that uh, uh, the IBC has reneged on a lot of its promises to Fatimun veterans. And many of them were uh, had to go back to Afghanistan to farms as uh, Shuja mentioned. And it's sort of becoming, it's not clear exactly how the RGC is going to navigate its ties with the Taliban while also maintaining a core of Fatimu fighters, some of whom have gained significant combat experience. Uh, while they're also doing in Iran, I also briefly want to touch on that is that there's a lot of uh, activities that the RGC has sponsored with the Fatimu sort of 
cultural event, a uh, veteran association. There was when there was a flood uh, in Iran in 2019, Qasem Soleimani called on paramilitary groups to go to help people with the flood over there and fought the new fighters or who were former fighters who were stationed in Iran. They also went, that was very unpopular, largely with the Iranian public that created this perception that they were there to crack down on people or that whether these paramilitary groups would be used to crack down on protesters and on not to this in future if it comes down to it. So uh, that sort of strikes a really interesting contrast that there's all this emphasis. We see scores of documentaries by the Fatimi and sponsored by the Fatimi Media Center. They have all this access to these professional shops, RGC link work uh, shops that work with them. There's also one sponsored by the Imam Raza Foundation's media organizations uh, who work with the Fatimi and then the reality of it that the IHC has sort of tried to uh, cut into Pakistan's influence among the Taliban. Uh, these are some interesting trends to watch in the future uh, as we move forward. Well, I, I wish them luck with cutting into the Taliban's um, uh, influence there. So, uh, Shuja, go ahead. And actually, if you can just also, you know, let's cap this a little bit. Um, Give me your two finger and then um, maybe since you're there in Kabul, project forward. What's the future look like? Because that's one of the questions that we have. And then we'll turn to the Q&A from the audience. Sure. And thanks for giving me the floor again, Candace. Let's go back to the first to first principles with respect to the Fatimun. First principles are these are Shia fighters going to Syria to protect Shia shrines. Sectarian motivation. Um, and these were the principles that in some cases where there was voluntary motivation was the motivation and where there was a complex set of motivations, uh, coercion circumstances, but also uh, in, the, in, in, in the event that I were to die, I'd be dying in the defense of an honorable cause with respect to my, my faith. So when, when, when in, I suppose, November, if I remember this correctly, in November 2017, when the Fatimun's media division issued a statement effectively declaring Daesh defeated in Syria, it used very interesting terminology. It started using the word and those Zionists. And so what they're trying to do is they're actually trying to redefine, potentially sort of exploring the redefinition of the scope of the Fatimun's activities from a a, a fiercely and sort of pro-Shia anti-Daesh to Iran's broader uh, strategic talking points, which is uh, all of these Zionists, but also all of these Americans, the big Satan. Um, and so, and so um, when we talk about a, a Shia sectarian fight, uh, fighting group, it's important for us to also recognize that, um, and when we also hear about uh, reports of these people being deployed to Yemen, being deployed um, in uh, in Libya, I think a lot of those are reports at this point, as far as I know, uh, their deployment against Israeli interests, against US interests are still only reports, as far as I know, maybe some of the esteemed panelists here have more information than I do, uh, but I think that would actually then veer into Iran's own strategic object objectives, as opposed to the strategic objectives of a sectarianly motivated Afghan Shia fighting force. And so going back to the first principles, I think uh, this group uh, would probably, A, because they don't really blend in in Yemen, they look very different, uh, they don't really blend in anywhere else, they, they even didn't blend in in Syria itself. Um, uh, and, and B, they're really not trained to fight those, those Israelis or those Zionists. They're not really trained to fight or motivated to fight those Americans or those Libyans uh, for that matter. So I think, um, I don't know how much of that is really Iran trying to whip up an enemy after they ostensibly defeated ISIS to keep this, the, 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 the group motivated and the group uh, uh, united and how much it really reflects Iran's long-term interest in deploying these people in these against these enemies. But in any case, I think at the current moment, the evidence I know of is very limited with respect to the use, uh, actual or perceived uh, or planned of the Fatimun against uh, these non-ISIS uh, targets. I mean, such excellent points. As you were talking, I was thinking about the old adage in journalism, which is, you know, 
um, in, in war, truth is the first casualty. And it's just one of the things I think that is so important to keep in mind here, which is why we've spent so much time exploring uh, the propaganda machine that Iran has kind of erected in order to support the Fatimiyun uh, and to keep it alive is, um, you know, because especially from this distance here in Washington, uh, you know, perhaps from Brussels, um, because there is this kind of language barrier, cultural barrier uh, between those who are observing from the outside and those who are experiencing from the inside and have kind of a better ground truth. Uh, Iran has a distinct advantage in being able to amplify untruths or to color things in ways um, that uh, make it look more effective in its management of the Fatimiyun. So let me turn to um, Q and A here. We've got about uh, you know about fourteen minutes left here in our, in our call, um, and uh, you know we've got some great questions. So first, uh, of course, we kind of begun to sort of probe this: of what is the future of the Fatimiyun in Afghanistan and the Middle East? And we can, I think, I'd ask you know each of the panelists to try and weave that in because people are very curious, um, knowing that we are only weeks away from the full, complete drawdown of U.S. forces. Um, that is certainly on people's minds. But I think the question that uh, rises to the top here uh, is one, uh, what kind of, you know, what do pa pa Pakistani actions um, mean in terms of waging proxy warfare against the United States? Like, what can we expect from Pakistan? And Ali, you began to kind of broach that a little bit. Um, but, you know, now we've got a situation where uh, the, the sort of the, the chief boogeyman, the United States is leaving. Um, it should shift to some degree Pakistan's uh, position in terms of how it wants to see things fall out in Afghanistan. Well, what can we expect from Pakistan? And I'd like to hear from each one of you, but I'm going to start with Ali. Uh, well, I do believe that uh, Pakistan has uh, managed to prevail in, in the war. It is uh, promoting uh, and heightening uh, the, the prestige of the Pakistani military. And it also tells the entire world that their strategic thinking is much deeper than any kind of strategic thought uh, at the Washington think tanks. That I believe is the bitter reality. Uh, but of course, Pakistan would also be concerned that uh, the, the Taliban develop a sense of agency once uh, and if, and unfortunately this may be the truth, uh, when uh, Taliban seizes uh, Kabul, they will also have responsibility for the Afghan state. Uh, they will be on top of a system and they will not only be uh, just a Pakistani proxy, they will also try to pursue their own agenda. And we already see those tendencies within the Taliban where they are trying to play Pakistan, the United States and Iran against each other. That is a very, very clever game that the Taliban is, is now playing. So I do believe that the chief concern uh, of Islamabad in the coming years would be how to uh, see to it that the Taliban is still more dependent on Pakistan rather than any other state. And Iran's concern and attempt would be to get as close to the Taliban regime uh, as possible because they do know that the Chajik and Hazara uh, communities alone cannot help Iran overthrow the Taliban regime. I mean, super interesting point. Let me turn to Arif actually for his take, because I mean, what you're saying, Ali, is essentially the Taliban, um, you know, for all intents and purposes, maybe will own their own problem. Uh, and, you know, then they'll be at the top of the pile, uh, potentially alongside, uh, you know, portions of the Afghan government today, trying to navigate a, a very unstable state. Arif, what do you think? Uh, let me tell you that uh, actually Iran is now starting another interesting uh, phase of uh, interaction and interference, or I should call it intervention in Afghanistan. Uh, they are approaching the Taliban and they are hosting the Taliban officials in Tehran. At the same time, we hear from our contacts and sources that the Iranian IRGC is pushing Fatimiyun and pro Fatimiyun people within Iran, within the Shia community in Iran, uh, to explore venues of cooperation and venues of interaction with the Taliban. So, this is adding a new uh, sort of 
uh, story to the uh, overall uh, scenario. This means that Iranians don't want their, uh, the Shia community to confront the Taliban's advancement, uh, especially when the Taliban are rushingly uh, advancing uh, and they are controlling territories. And now we have lost a, a couple of district centers and central highlands where Shia is populated in Afghanistan. So for Iran, uh, the Taliban's emergence again at the political arena is, uh, I think they have made all major, they have taken some very important measures uh, from several years back. Uh, they have been supporting the Taliban cause of insurgency in the west of the country. And uh, now they are working within the Shia community in Iran to form a kind of shura in Mashhad or somewhere. And this shura will be somehow trying to touch base and communicate with the Taliban officials within the Western part of Afghanistan so that to avoid a confrontation of kind of sectarian thing uh, that took place back in the 1990s uh, where some few massacres took place. So I think that the Iranians are trying to mitigate this uh, and they don't want the Shia community to be uh, to be attacked or to be uh, to become victims of violence by the Taliban, but this is not easy. Uh, as far as I understand, the Taliban are a different group, and uh, all politicians, including President Joe Biden, says that we can never trust the Taliban. And this is the question raised by the Iranians to their uh, officials: that do you trust the Taliban? Uh, and we hear a lot of negative uh, commentaries now within the Iranian audience about the recent behaviors of the Iranian regime with the Taliban. So, in general, uh, Taliban will serve as a main proxy force in Afghanistan for Pakistan rather than Iran. And I think the honeymoon between Iran and uh, the Taliban will not last long because once they control Kabul, there will be a lot of issues on the border and there will be a lot of issues which might uh, threaten the interest of Iranians, including cultural issues and historical issues that uh, Afghanistan and uh, Iranians have. So this is uh, evident that the Taliban might be present for a long time in the borders of Iran, uh, particularly in Farah and Nimroz, Kandahar and Nilman, something like that. But in general, uh, I should say that the Iranians will also try to maintain their uh, connections and relationships with the former Northern Alliance and current uh, Afghan uh, leaders like Ismail Khan, like General Atta Muhammad in Noor in the North, like uh, like uh, Mr. Khalili and Muhaqiq uh, who are uh, representing the Shia Hazaras. So they don't want to put all their eggs in one basket and it's important for Iranians to maintain all these. And I think IRGC has been doing that for the past few decades and they have maintained a sort of private and different types of organized and unorganized uh, connections with all important actors uh, on the ground. So, I mean, uh, before I turn to Amir, uh, and we do have a couple more questions here, so I want to make sure with our remaining five minutes, we do get to at least one of them. Um, but let me just comment on, on something that you just pointed out. I mean, everybody, you know, on this, on this, uh, at this event today, uh, on this panel today, I think understands that you have um, the states, right, Iran, uh, Pakistan, United States, all operating on their own kind of plane. And then you have um, the various, you know, militias and proxy forces, uh, Taliban, Fatah Mayun, and then there are other factions, of course, who all kind of have a stake in Afghanistan. Um, but we haven't really talked about this. And I'm just going to flag it simply just to say it. Um, there is this other dynamic, uh, you know, in addition to the potential military blowback that Iran may reap from its kind of balancing act between uh, portions of the Afghan population, whether it's with the Taliban or, or with the Fatimi Yun, um, the region as a whole will experience incredible blowback in terms of the drug trade. Uh, and we haven't really talked about that a lot, but you know, the Taliban uh, coming to power uh, will certainly change uh, the calculus for a lot of stakeholders uh, who are not part of the state, who are not part of any militia. Um, they're part of an entirely uh, different informal uh, gray economy uh, that very much shapes 
some, some of these interactions that we're talking about, uh, and, and not just the opium trade, but there's also smuggling routes as well. Um, and I think that's going to have a huge effect on the future of Afghanistan. So Amir, um, I'm going to ask, I'm going to pose a question as well uh, that's coming to us from the audience um, that's sort of related. So two, kind of, I'm going to merge them together. So two questions um, that are kind of related. One is, we haven't really talked about uh, the Zanabi Yoon uh, Brigade, which of course is the Pakistani sister uh, to, to the Fatimi Yoon, uh, and, and audience members ask us about that, and then some of these related um, smaller militias, the Ali Yoon, uh, the Hyderi Yoon, et cetera. And um, you know, a question I'll try and answer here from our colleagues over at ASU, uh, and maybe you can chime in as well, is, uh, you know, what about the interaction between Russian forces and IRGC-backed militias in Syria? So, Amir, over to you. In the two All minutes right. left. <laughs> All right, in the two minutes that I have. Uh, so, short answer is that uh, the IRGC's effort to mobilize Pakistani Shia fighters was significantly more covert than its effort to mobilize Afghan Shia fighters because uh, it was more afraid of ISI and Pakistan uh, than uh, of the other situation that it faced. So uh, they mobilized, it was on a smaller scale, several hundred people, uh, smaller diaspora in Iran, and they operated as very much auxiliaries to the Fatih immune. Uh, but that's an interesting dynamic over there. And then on the second question, uh, would you mind repeating that? Because there was a couple of things to ask. Yeah, well, there's a lot of things. I mean, it's, it's a complicated spaghetti of a, a challenge over here. Um, mm -hmm. So one of the questions was about the Russians and the interaction between mm -hmm. the Russians uh, in Syria uh, and, and with the Fatima Yun and Shia fighters. Uh, that one, uh, on the base level, that uh, they were coordinated through the IRGC because the IRGC was the ground forces of the Russians and the Russians were the air force of the IRGC in terms of like, and we do mention a case where Fatim Yun alongside the Wagner group, they tried to attack American forces and they, uh, it did not go that well for them. Uh, so that's something uh, where the that's something that, so there's been instances where this was more motivated by money, so to speak, that there was this opportunity uh, for them to do so. And I guess it sort of lends a little bit of credit to the report that the Fatim Yun, that there was a unit or some people who deployed to Libya uh, from Syria directly. <clears throat> So let me, um, I know Arif wants to jump in with the last comments and we literally have exactly 30 seconds. So let me just quickly just also speak on the Wagner Group piece. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Wagner Group is, uh, the so-called Wagner Group is a network of, of Russian private, uh, private military security contractors uh, that has operated around the world, uh, most notably in Ukraine, uh, in the Donbass uh, Eastern area of, of Ukraine. Uh, and then they also traveled to Syria uh, we've seen them in Libya and elsewhere. And so this rumor about, about sort of, you know, uh, Fatimian fighters um, traveling to Libya to fight probably stems to some degree from that um, original relationship that bubbled up around 2013, 14. Um, I mean, the relationship is really one of convenience just as anything else in, in these contexts. Um, and the Wagner Group, uh, you know, was very instrumental in supporting the, uh, the recruitment and mobilization of uh, the fourth and fifth core militias in, in Syria. Uh, and it is there that there's a sort of intersection between the Shia fighters from, from Afghanistan. Uh, Ari, if you have exactly 30 seconds to make your point, uh, and then we're gonna close it out. Thank you. I just wanted to mention that the future of Fatim in Afghanistan is uh, quite dismal. As Shuja put it very profoundly and nicely that there is a diverse background of uh, recruitments. So the Fatimian are not welcomed at the moment in the society because uh, the foot soldiers have no independent and organized view about the politics in Afghanistan. Uh, most of these recruiters uh, who have been joining from Iran, they are cut off from the Afghan society and from the Shia society within Afghanistan. They are the third generation uh, fighters. So they will not return to Afghanistan actually. 
And more importantly, uh, the dominant uh, political actors in the Shia society in Afghanistan, in the Shia community in Afghanistan, have no organized uh, relationship with Fatih Mun division or with Iran. So IRGC is also cut off with them at the moment. And most importantly, I should say that the Afghan Shia religious authorities and scholars who are based in Qum and they are very influential, so far they have not issued any sort of statement to support Fatih Mun's further uh, uh, activities across the region or also in Afghanistan. So these are some of the factors that tell us that in the near future, if there is no sectarian violence in Afghanistan, there will be no place for Fatih Mun to return. So the Fatih Mun will be mostly used sporadically uh, in those uh, areas where we talked, uh, they will remain, uh, some, some of them will remain as mercenaries in the borders of Syria and Israel, or maybe in Yemen and other places. Excellent points. Um, this panel was fire, I, I have to say. Shuja, um, Arif, Amir, Ali, thank you so much for joining us today at New America. Uh, for those of you who are online uh, listening in, uh, watching us, please do check out our report, Suleimani's Shadow. Uh, it's out today, and uh, we will be tweeting about this, and you'll be able to see uh, the full recording of this um, panel later uh, within the next 24 hours online via newamerica.org. Thanks so much.